Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for the Big Arabic Community Day of 2023. My name is Amani Al Hamidi. I am a first year neuroscience psychology major and a preschool caregiver at UNL Children's Center. I also coach competitive speech at Lincoln Southwest and judge at tournaments throughout the season. The Big Arabic Community Day is an annual event made to highlight important topics related to Arabic language and culture, as well as the Arabic program here at UNL. Thank you to all of our co-sponsors of today's event, including Muslim Students Association, Muslim Women's Collective, and Middle Eastern North African Students Association. Also, thank you to our volunteers for today, Rusul Al-Bawi, Yasser al Mataura, Clark Mogadam, and Danny Vinton as well as our amazing photographer, Hajar Al-Eid. So I am so pleased to host this event today, especially because of the topic being discussed, bringing the Arabic language as a subject for all Lincoln Public School students to take. As someone who was born and raised in the south of Lincoln, let's just say I know a thing or two about people who don't know a thing or two about Arabic language or culture. It all started in kindergarten, when we were sitting at our tiny tables and our tiny chairs, and our teacher gave us an assignment to share our nicknames with the other kids at our tables. So we all went around saying our nicknames. Luke became Lukey, Liz became Lizzie, and so on. Then it was my turn. When I was little, I used to eat a lot of olives, so my family called me Olive in Arabic. So I told them, Zaytuna. Then they all laughed at me because they thought it was a funny word. So shout out to everyone who sat at table one in my kindergarten class. You could all use some Arabic lessons. Of course, I'm not angry anymore at my five-year-old classmates for never having been exposed to Arabic. I mean, it's not their fault. Kids are naturally curious creatures. The problem is when they get older and still don't know any Arabic words except kebab and falafel and can't name any Arab city except Dubai. Our Arabic names went from Hamid to Mo, Yahya to Yaya, Asma to Asma, Kamal to Camel, all for the sake of making beautiful Arab names easier to pronounce for English speakers. It's time that we move on from this lack of effort. However, it's not just the non-Arabs who are struggling to understand Arabic. Us Arabs can be guilty of it ourselves. If you're anything like me, I like to consider myself a fluent Arabic speaker. Of course, until I actually step into an Arab-speaking country and then get humbled by all of my relatives. A lot of us Arab Americans have become used to starting a sentence in one language and then finishing it in the next. When it comes to filling the gaps in a language you already know most of, Duolingo is just not going to do the trick. And we can't keep letting people butcher our names. All of these experiences from both English speakers and Arabic speakers make one thing very clear. Arabic should definitely be a language taught in public schooling. And that's exactly why we're all here today. But today, as we celebrate Arab culture, make new friends, and enjoy this event, let's not forget about our brothers and sisters in Turkey and Syria who are currently suffering due to the recent earthquakes. If you have a thought or prayer, please take a moment to acknowledge them. And always remember, when disaster strikes, we don't have to limit ourselves to thoughts and prayers, but also pitch into the rescue and recovery effort by donating to reliable charities. At last, I would like to introduce Dr. Abla Hassan, the coordinator of the Arabic Studies program here at UNL. She is the author of Decoding the Egalitarianism of the Quran, Retrieving Lost Voices on Gender, Lexington 2019, On Pain and Suffering, A Quranic Perspective, Lexington 2022, and The Quranic Dilemma, A Hermeneutical Investigation of Al Khadr, Rutledge 2022. And don't leave early because we have 20 boxes of baklawa to give away. Thank you so much. Isn't she great or what? <laughs> Let's put our hands together one more time for, for Amuna, as we call her in my woman in the Quran class. Welcome everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan, or as we say in Syria, meet marhaba. 100 marhabas to all of you. Uh, 
Uh, today, we're not only celebrating the annual uh, Day of the Arabic Studies program, we're celebra celebrating the 10th annual day. So uh, back uh, 2013, we started the Arabic Studies program, which has uh, been offering uh, three years of, of Arabic language, uh, courses on, on uh, the Arabic culture, and we still have more surprises to share with you. We're giving away some handouts today with updates. Uh, please take uh, some of the flyers uh, to share some of the uh, updates with you. We're starting the first Arabic camp, Arabic language camp, the first two weeks uh, of August this year. We're starting, um, we're, we're gonna be offering one more time all online uh, intensive Arabic during summer, which means uh, uh, 10 weeks, one year of Arabic, all online in 10 weeks. And the big news, uh, starting from next fall, we're gonna make Arabic language available to all the students in Nebraska. And you'll hear me, uh, correct, right. It's all the students in Nebraska. It's online, and the first two years are going to be available online to students at Omaha UNO and Kearney UNK as well. Just uh, one one uh, link to, to, to go through to be able to take Arabic, which is not offered there yet. Uh, so happy to be sharing with you all the updates, and so happy to be sharing more on uh, offering Arabic in Lincoln Public Schools with my wonderful panelists today. Uh, back in 2020, we had the first Arabic forum, and we invited people from the community. Some of the organizers who helped us do that are, are with us today as well. And 65 awesome parents joined us, brought food, and when we asked them Arabic food, not any food, Sukaina is laughing, good food. And when we asked them, what would you like us to do? They said, we would like to see Arabic offered at Lincoln Public Schools. And guess what? Arabic is offered now at two high school, North Star and Northeast. Today we're here to talk with our distinguished panelists on this huge progress to think of the current status of offering Arabic, to hear from you again, we're here to serve you, the program is a community-based program, and to think of our future hopes for Arabic. Uh, my friend and my colleague, Dr. Lori Dance, agreed and accepted the invitation to moderate the panel. Dr. Lori Dance is Associate Professor of Sociology and Ethnic Studies, an educator, a distinguished researcher, an activist, a well-known activist by the Arab community. Give me thumbs up, please. Give me thumbs up for that. And a closer friend. Dance holds a BA from Georgetown University, a master's degree from Harvard University, and a PhD degree from Harvard University. In regard to recent activities, Dance has been a co-principal investigator of the Middle East in the contemporary world, a grant project, multi-million research project, funded by the Swedish Research Council and housed at Lund University Center for Middle Eastern Studies in Lund, Sweden. Without further ado, uh, I'm gonna give it to, to Dr. Lori to start our panel today. Thank you, Dr. Abla. Dr. Abla makes me look so good. She is the one that made this event happen. So I just have to make sure you all know this is not my magic. This is Dr. Abla's magic. I want to welcome the panelists. Um, and before I ask questions, I'm going to ask each panelist a question. Um, and then they will answer. And then we'll have time for Q&A. But first, I want to let you know who's on the panel. So if you could raise your hand when I say your name. We got Mr. Mohammed Salah Anajem. See, now I'm all nervous and I'm gonna mispronounce words and not get the names right. <laughs> Mr. Mohammed was born and raised in Iraq. He completed his bachelor's degree in Iraq in education with a major in Arabic language and a minor in psychology. His teaching certificate endorsement is in Arabic literature and grammar from the University of Basra in Iraq. At UNL, he completed both his master's degree in, in educational administration and teaching certificate renewal courses. 
Mr. Anajem was eager to work with Lincoln Public Schools to offer the Arabic language as a world language for the first time. Even though he had worked with Lincoln Public Schools as a bilingual liaison for 14 years, he kept his dream of being a teacher and set teaching Arabic as a goal. Mr. Mr. Anajem, Mr. Muhammad, had to renew his teaching certificate twice just to keep his educational requirements up to date, but he believed the core of this mission suited what he had to offer as a professional. A fun fact about Mr. Muhammad, he is married and has four kids, Two graduates from UNL got two Huskers and one current Husker, one currently at UNL, and a girl in kindergarten, constantly making the house lively and joyous. He has lived in Lincoln, Nebraska for more than half his life since from 1996 to today. Thanks, so that's Mr. Muhammad, thank you. Now, um, Lukia Zarub, Dr. Lukia Zarub. So Dr. Lukia Zarub is the Marvin C. and Jane N. Noor Professor and Chair of the Department of Teaching and Learning and Teacher Education. She received her bachelor's degree in linguistics at the University of Chicago and her PhD in curriculum and education policy and social analysis at Michigan State University. She was a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as well as a visiting scholar in the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Berkeley. Her publications range from cross-cultural studies that include fieldwork in schools, immigrant and refugee communities in the US and Europe, to studies about youth cultures, religion, and literacy, Middle Eastern publications, her Middle Eastern publications, including fieldwork in Yemeni and Iraqi communities. She is the author of the award-winning All American Yemeni Girls Being Muslim in a Public School, and co-author of and editor of Doing Field Work at Home, The Ethnography of Education in Familiar, familiar Contexts. Fun fact, fact about Dr. Sarub is that she adopted a cat named Montesquieu, and this cat meows in several different languages. <laughs> Dr. Kate Damgaard, could you raise your hand? So I wanna, there was a mistake on the flyer. This is Dr. Kate instead of Mrs. Kate, but Dr. Kate Damgaard is the Lincoln Public Schools language curriculum specialist. In the Lincoln Public Schools, she works with ESL, that's English as a Second Language, heritage and world language programs. Her mission is to ensure programming supports and reflects the global community here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Fun fact about Dr. Damgaard, went to a one-room schoolhouse for one year in her life. I asked her if that was fun and she said no, but it is a fun fact. Uh, Mr. Fayez Ahmed, would you please raise your hand? Yes, thank you. Mr. Fayez has been a resident of Lincoln for the past 15 years. He is an IT engineer by profession. Also, he is the current president of the Islamic Foundation of Lincoln, which is a nonprofit and non-governmental organization. Fun fact about Mr. Fayez, he enjoys his kids and spends a lot of time with them. Mr. Arang Zeb. <laughs> Mr. 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 Arang moved to Lincoln, Nebraska in 2003. He runs a real estate and construction business. He's an important community member and has run twice for election in Lincoln city government. Fun fact, he likes to play volleyball. <laughs> Mr. Ahmad Issa came to the United States as a refugee in 1996 along with his wife, mother, and younger sister. He was placed in New York and lived there for a couple of years before deciding to move to Lincoln, Nebraska in 1998. Since then, he started his own business in 2005 and continues to call Lincoln home. A fun fact about Mr. Ahmed is that he recently became a grandpa. So I, I think, did I get everyone? I introduced everyone, didn't miss anyone? Okay, so I'm gonna ask each panelist a question. You have three minutes, but at five minutes, Yasser, who's sitting on the front, 
He's going to let you know when you have two minutes left, because five minutes is the max, and we want to hear from everyone on the panel. And at the end, there will be time for a Q&A from the audience. So again, thank you, panelists, for joining us today. It is a distinct pleasure to have you here. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about this process and how it came together. OK, so the first question is to Mr. Ahmed Isa. At the Community Arabic Forum held in January 25th, 2020, Yes, thank you. They have to share mics. So I'll start the question over again. At the Community Arabic Forum held in held January 25th, 2020, we, Professor Abla and I, co-organized. Arabic language maintenance was a common concern. Most people in the room spoke about this. So why, in your opinion, do members of the Arabic heritage community in Nebraska especially in Lincoln and Omaha, see this as an important issue. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Abla and Dr. Lori for in, uh, inviting me. <clears throat> and thank you all uh, for coming here today. And uh, honestly, uh, there's uh, the, the Lincoln or the Arab community uh, is growing up like very fast and, 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 and getting bigger for the past 20 years. And the the Arabic language, as most of you know, it's a very unique language. It's very important for, I would say, all, for all Arab people and the all Muslim, over about, about almost two billion people over the world, it's important to, because the, the, our prayer, our religion, it's connected to the, to, the, uh, to the Arabic, honestly. Which is, I'm, I'm personally, like, you know, the, the, my, my point is, I'm Kurdish, like uh, Arabic my second language, I will say, uh, the English my third language. Uh, uh, forgive me if I make any mistake or, or any uh, shortcoming, like it's not, not, not great uh, English. But the uh, Arabic is a very unique language, like I said. Uh, we must uh, do something for our, our next generation. If we don't do it, or if we, do, if we don't like pass, our, pass down our, like, you know, the, the Arabic language for the next generation, they will be completely lost. It's very important for every one of us and for, to, to make, it, make it easy for our, our next generation to, uh, to learn Arabic. Or to, at least, the, 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 uh, honestly, my, my daughter was telling me she was the, the, uh, the first thing or first, uh, st first time study the Arabic. It was, was in UNL in this, in this class with the Dr. Abla, honestly which is very important for, for every one of us to, to work harder and, and make, it, make it easy for our next generation. I Thank think. you. Thank you. And that was something that was said at the community forum, this, uh, this, this desire to have grandchildren speak with grandparents and great-grandparents. Thank you. Thank you. The next question goes to Dr. Damgaard, Dr. Kate. So please tell us more about the process and work that went into teaching Arabic in Lincoln High Schools. Uh, just speaking earlier with one of the panelists about how things move quite slowly in Lincoln Public Schools. Um, and I would have to say this is one of the processes that I've actually seen move quicker than other programs have taken. Um, I think a lot of it started here within this panel of interest of community members of making sure that we are keeping the languages that are here in Lincoln alive. Um, and so the interest from the public went to the school board. And I think even some of it started a little bit before I stepped into my role in Lincoln Public Schools um, as the language curriculum specialist. But the public brings the interest of, we would like to see this offered for our students, looking at what research shows about best practice of making sure that our community and our schools reflect one another. And we saw that as a gap. So doing some studies and then going to the different schools where we saw there was large Arabic populations within the schools and seeing what interest was out there out amongst the students, talking to the families, talking to our bilingual liaisons that work in Lincoln Public Schools with the families and within the different communities, and then generating that interest, um, and then working with the principals, our human resources, and making sure that we could secure the staffing, secure the points, and then making sure that we could support that process of curriculum development to make sure that we support those teachers. Granted, it moved a lot quicker than what a lot of our other programs are, have been um, as they step into 
the classroom. But um, with that process, we were able to move it quite quickly from the time from 2021 into here we are now at the end of the school year with having two high schools adopting um, Arabic for Arabic speakers. Thank you. And because bureaucracies, bureaucracies are slow, aren't they? They are very slow. So they, they need community members, but they also need persons like you to keep things flowing. Thank you, Dr. Damgog. My next question goes to Mr. Fayez. If you could wave a magic wand to improve the status of heritage languages like Arabic in schools and other mainstream spaces, would you change anything? If so, what would you change? I'm really honored to come here and thank you for the invite. Um, and, and that's really a, a, a great question. Like, you know, when you say magic wand, magic stick. So I wish there was a magic stick, right? I mean, we could change everything according to our needs. But technically, if you see it, um, there are a lot of things involved when you think about the language perspective, right? Especially as just doctor said, uh, it's not an easy process. So there are a lot of components involved in this process. So I think in my perspective, um, the first thing I can maybe I think, I mean, we have to come up with a uh, process or build a structure so that, you know, it's easy to learn for the students as well as the kids. And as language itself, learning is a fun. Right, so if you present that in a fun facts or in a in a meaningful way that the students can easily understand it, adapt it, and then it's 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 easy to uh, build them in with respect to learning of the the heritage languages that you have here. So, and and, and the the second thing maybe I think the components it all is like you know the administrative components like you know you need to have the right resources. I mean. Uh, especially like, you know, what I have felt because I have come from, uh, I used to stay in East Coast, and when I came to Lincoln, like, you know, I saw like, you know, it's a laid back community and laid back uh, uh, state also, like, you know, at the same time, uh, I stayed back here because Lincoln is a beautiful uh, community to raise a family for sure, and you have a beautiful university also here. Um, so uh, if you see the lack of resources, it's, it's hard to find. So, but at the same time, if you see it, now with the technology, it's easy to do it also. So there are a lot of uh, programs available online that you can utilize those programs in order to uh, put into the uh, curriculum and build the curriculum and build a structure so that uh, the students can learn anywhere, right? I mean, we saw like in our COVID times, we, we pretty much learn all the students, like in everybody here, I think in this, in this hall, they learn online, sitting in, in, in school, uh, they're sitting in their uh, bedrooms. So uh, the learning has never stopped. Uh, that's one thing actually, like, you know, uh, finding a resource and then we have to come up with a, 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 uh, a structure and then build a right curriculum for that one. But in order to do that, you need to have a, I guess, I mean, uh, right amount of uh, uh, funds, as just doctor said. So that's also hard to write uh, in order to get the funds and put into the right uh, uh, manner so that you can, uh, uh, the, uh, the faculties can get right access to all the, uh, the curriculum and then the study materials, what they have to teach. So, and then and, and maybe the, uh, the, the other component is like, you know, uh, you have to come up with a different programs. Like for example, this, this is one program, right? In order to promote the, uh, the heritage languages. So you might have to find different ways in order to promote the languages so that you can uh, invite different communities. Also, apart from just, okay, now what I see is, I mean, here, a lot of the audiences like are from the Arabic background community, but, but, but that's not important. The important is how you want to reach to the other communities that how you can uh, promote this, this, this language as a specific to the other community so they can be interested also. As, as, uh, as uh, Brother uh, uh, Ahmadisa said, like, you know, there are a lot of Muslims, two billion Muslims, and, and they are connected back to the Arabic language. And everybody reads Arabic, but they cannot speak it. My, myself, actually, like, you know, I'm from Asia, I'm from India. 
So I can read, I can write Arabic, but I learn on my own, basically, like, you know, we had a tutor coming into our houses and teach it. My own kids right now, I have two years, two boys, 12 and 10. For them, I have put them on online teaching. A tutor from India, like, you know, he's teaching every day to the kids. So why don't we promote, like, you know, hear more and come up with a solution so that everybody can have an option in order to choose uh, this type of heritage language, right? So. I think I mean, that's all I have to say. Sorry, I think you were saying two <laughs> minutes. I think I went too far about that. So no, he didn't put up the stop. So he didn't put up stop yet. Yes. So you must have been with it. <laughs> but so what I hear you saying though is that we are the magic. We are the magic. Yes. You are the magic. The the creativity in the community. Right. The yes. Per pers perseverance in the community. Just thinking about how to use the resources, but to get more resources. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I feel like Oprah Winfrey or something up here. Um, <laughs> next question to Dr. Lucia. If you could wave a magic wand to improve the status of heritage languages like Arabic in schools and other mainstream spaces, would you change anything? So again, and if you would, what would you change? And is there anything else you would say like about supporting heritage languages in Lincoln Public Schools? If so, what? I think that um, there are a couple of things to remember which are connected to the geopolitical context of any kind of language learning. So first of all, I don't know if you know this fun fact, but Arabic is one of the six official languages of the United Nations. So when Lincoln Public Schools chooses to include Arabic as one of the languages that is offered in the curriculum, then it's really in line with a global movement that's been in place for quite a while. So I want everyone to know that. The other interesting fact is, and you are probably all aware of this, is that the geopolitical context is that Nebraska is a refugee designated state. And yes, the dominant language in Nebraska and probably most of the country is English, but a heritage language is any language, according to linguists at least, that are part of community life. The discourses that we do work with, the languages that make sense as we go about our everyday life. So it would make sense that Lincoln Public Schools takes a look around the community and discovers, you know, we have all these Arabic language speakers. And so it, it makes sense, it's logical that we would offer such classes either at the university or in a public school system because the community really um, asks for it. It's part of everyday life. So what are some reasons that um, we can talk about that are related to the status of uh, a heritage language like Arabic? Well, it really matters that young people understand it, read it, are literate in it, and are uh, multilingual with Arabic. Um, one of the consequences of both Gulf Wars is that um, Iraq lost a lot of very interesting, wonderful people um, in its own country, um, whether they were um, Iraqi, Kurdish, or um, other Iraqis who came to the United States and ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska. One of the reasons to know Arabic and to learn it as a heritage language is that you may not be aware that there are intellectuals in Lincoln who have written books, who have written poetry, who have written political treatises. And it's very sad to me that the younger generations may not have access to those writings and books. I, I have two of them that um, I gathered from Mr. al -E, who gave me the political writings that he wrote as a math teacher in Iraq many years ago. And when I met him, he said to me, I hope someday these can be translated into English. And I said to him, the first thing I have to do is to find someone who knows both Arabic and English better than I do. So one of my home languages was Arabic, but I grew up in Al Jazair in, in Algeria. And my French is stronger than my Arabic because I was educated in a bilingual system too. And so I don't necessarily know the dialects of all the Middle Eastern countries. So I would have to learn those. And the power in this community and in the public schools of having folks from so many different countries is that there can be a shared understanding of the different dialects. So when you have teachers who are 
um, pulling on the resources from the community, they can actually inform the Arabic teacher in the Arabic teaching of the classroom from dialects that are in acted in people's homes. And that's very important. That's a strong resource. So this idea of being literate, biliterate, and multilingual is key in order to pass on information and to do the work that we do in everyday life. And it can't hurt us in terms of a community in staying connected with the world. And again, I go back to this idea, Arabic is an official language of the United Nations. So it's really wonderful that we're also making it official in the public schools. And I'm grateful that Kate has been part of that and this group has been part of that. Thank you, thank you. I think that's very powerful. I mean, for those of you who, I know many of you speak more than two languages, but to speak English and Arabic opens parts of the world up to you where you can interact directly with people. And I have, having spent time in Europe, I wish the US were much more cosmopolitan in the way that you've just mentioned, Dr. Zaru, because the ability to speak more than one language is something to be proud of. We don't always get that in the US. Yes. This room. All right. OK. <laughs> A question for Mr. Mohammed. Can we encourage offering the Arabic in other schools? Could the Lincoln Public Schools become a model? Tell us more about your experience teaching Arabic in Lincoln Public Schools so far. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Dance, and thank you, Dr. Hassan, for the invitation. Thank you to the participant, and thank you to the audience who is attending today. This is really amazing to see some people have the passion to see Arabic language in Lincoln, Nebraska. First of all, um, some of the community here knew uh, where we started and our goal to begin with. And we started at the mosque, private school, teaching our kids. Um, we did a lot before we come to this, uh, to this point. So Arabic language in Lincoln, Nebraska and in Lincoln Public School specifically was a goal for me personally and was a goal for the community. Without the community, I would not do nothing. So thank you to our community who has that passion and you know, eager to learn Arabic, eager to learn speci specifically for fathers and mothers, parents of the kids who would like to teach, them, just like Ahmed said, who would like to teach their kids Arabic and they would like to transfer the heritage that they had to their kids and don't leave them in ignorant, don't know nothing, or they do have another language, a second language, it's a good language at home. As we say, the sixth language now on the United Nation is number six. And um, we don't have it here in Lincoln, Nebraska. In Lincoln, Nebraska, we do have a good Arabic community, and it's a big Arabic community. Beside, we have some non-Arabic, like Kurdish or some other Muslim, they do speak Arabic, and they would like to learn Arabic. My dream also, and Kate probably aware of this too, when we try to, when we talk about heritage language, uh, my goal is it will not stop at the heritage language. It will be a word language. It's not only heritage language and it's offering for uh, our Arabic uh, students or the student who has a native Arabic or close. Uh, the the goal is to open it for everyone because I see, for example, lots of uh, political issues. I saw ambassadors, I saw from Russia, from China, from Japan, when they go to our country, uh, they speak Arabic. But I see ambassador from United States, when she go to our country, she speak English. Okay, this is a big, you know, we, we should be able to train our students here, even Native American, in Arabic language and another language. So when they go, our kids, it's our future. And we care for this community. And we would like to see some, some scholars from Lincoln to be on those high positions. And they are, represent their country in their own language and that countries too not only here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Going back to your questions is, uh, yes, we do. 
Kate was trying to open, which is without, we are working as a team, without team, we cannot do a lot. Uh, we were trying to open Lincoln High last year, but we stopped at two schools for a few reasons. I only have like two or one minutes left of my time, so I cannot go further. But just to let you know that we are in the process, hopefully, to go to Lincoln High next year, and then probably to more school on the, you know, and we are in the process to looking for more teachers, uh, certified teacher in Arabic language. So we would like to, and we would like definitely to be a model for others to follow. We are doing our own curriculums now, and we are proud of what, what we are doing. And our kids learning so fast. And just like you mentioned, the standard language and the home language are different from, from one to the other. I have students from Iraq, from Syria, from Sudan, and some other Muslim besides Kurdish, and, and they are enjoying the accent, and they are at the same time enjoying the standard language. When they go home, when we teach numbers, for example, and they will tell their families, don't say Daesh or Athnaash or Thalatash. There is no Taash in Arabic language. <laughs> there is Ahad Ashar, Athnaashar, Thalatat Ashar. So they are learning the standard. Besides, they know that I said, I accept both from you. It's your home language and it's the standard language. So they are enjoy it and I am I'm proud to be the first person who is opening this, I mean, with the definitely with the help of Kate and other scholars without the team and without the community, we cannot do a lot. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have nothing to add to that. I'm just happy to hear that it's going to continue to move, the, that it will be moving the language, Arabic and other schools. I'm so happy to hear that. So one more question, a question for Mr. Orang, Mr. Zeb. We would love to end with a community message to the Lincoln Public Schools. What would that message be? Asalaamu Alaikum. So, I came, you know, the, I think it's the first time here to, when you guys are going to start this program. So Dr. Abla, she invited me. So I just want to tell people, Arabic is not my native language. Um, anybody guess who's my mother language? Nobody can guess. My mother language is a Punjabi. So I'm Punjabi from Pakistan, and natural language is Urdu. But when we kids, we go to Madrisa and learn Quranic, Quran Arabic. So I can read all Arabic, but I don't understand all. So when I even, you know, I went to store here, so people, some say, oh, you, do you speak Arabic? I say, sure, sure. So that's how I want to know. So anyway, you know, the, uh, I support, you know, this uh, language because I was just reading is more than 330 million people in this world, this speak Arabic language, and more than 28 countries have official language. So, you know, we're living in America here, and, you know, we I'm glad to meet you know a lot of Arab people from different countries. So when I went to mosque, I meet some lot of Arab people too. So that's very good thing you guys start in this one in uh, school. So kids can you know is uh, mostly Arab kids or other they can learn this one and go back to native language. So even you know this for American for good too this one when they go overseas for job or for other. So they can, you know, communicate very easily. I even have a hard time when I went to Middle East. So I asked them, you know, I want to go outside. And they say, you have a comma. So I don't know what is a comma. So I keep asking, you know. So just some um, just mention this story because when you go to Arab country, mostly, you know, they speak just Arabic. So my message to community, you know, is a, that's very good program you guys start in uh, schools. So uh, I hope, you know, in the next few years, you guys start in all other schools. And then, you know, most we have a kids, they can communicate each other. So especially, you know, with the parents, I am request them, you know, they should talk with kids Arabic in home. 
so they don't forget native language. Because here people have issue, you know, some people move here this far, start talking English, but if kids forget mother language. So, you know, always whenever I came here, I asked Dr. Abla, I'm going to be your, your student this year so I can learn. But this not happened yet, but in future. <laughs> I hope it's soon, someday. So, you know, a, you guys are doing this amazing job. So I fully support, you know, a, if you guys need my any help to promote this program to city level or state level. So I'm in a little bit politics too, so I can help on this one too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, we have maybe 12 minutes, maybe we can push it to like 15 for a Q&A from the audience. And um, I'm gonna give up my mic and one of my graduate research assistants, if you raise your hand, we'll bring the mic up to you. Okay, so um, I was wondering what certification would be required to become an Arabic teacher at LPS? What education? I can answer that one, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Um, looking at offering, uh, becoming a teacher of Arabic in Lincoln Public Schools, there's a lot of flexibility uh, in that option. Um, more than anything, you have to have a teaching certificate. That is the main piece. But since it is not an endorsement program yet, um, it allows us to be a little bit more flexible on what the specific endorsement is for the teachers of Arabic. What we want to make sure and looking at the teachers that we hire here in Lincoln Public Schools is that they have a firm understanding of the Arabic language, um, looking at our heritage language program, knowing that we want to branch out to world language programming and understanding the difference between those two. But we want to make sure that we have as many native speakers who have that background experience and can bring that culture and enrichment to the program in Lincoln Public Schools. But the main piece is, is having your Nebraska a teaching certificate in order to be a teacher in Lincoln Public Schools or have um, starting that progress. You have to be at least halfway through that programming in order to start having some of those pieces in play. So um, that's the biggest ticket is keep going with education and having your teaching certificate. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Azzedine Tamish. My na uh, first language is Arabic. I'm or originally from Libya. Uh, actually, thank you for all of you. What did you say right now? And they have, you have some problems how to find fund and how to encourage people to uh, learn Arabic. But I think we have a question that how to improve the, the status of heritage language. Actually, the question should be how can improve the learning of Arabic language? How to support, push people our students to learn the second language, which is Arabic language. So first of all, I think we have two factors, which is very, very important. First one is the students itself. They have to know the benefit of learning another language, which is Arabic, for example. It will benefit them in the future to find very good job. The first thing, how they, they have to love this language before to learning it. Just I heard from my brother, he said that I, he has a couple of students from Iraq, Syria, whatever that region. We need American students to engage in that uh, course too. We need a student from this region to learn Arabic language. Second thing is we have to support and push families to be co-leaders of this course of this language. They have to engage with the teachers to work hard with their kids because they know kids more than us or more than teachers to, to improve this uh, skills and teach uh, Arabic language. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Manal and I am uh, learning Arabic here at UNL. Um, and I was just wondering, as an Arabic learning student here, I'm always looking for opportunities to practice Arabic outside of my home, maybe a professional setting. Are there any opportunities for students like myself um, that we could take advantage of, maybe at uh, LPS or anywhere around the community where we can practice our Arabic or teach it um, as a way of learning? Wow. 
I think I talked to Dr. Hassan one day, and we've been back and forth in emails. Um, I would like to help my students, and I would like to have a volunteer if you are a teacher. Or, and Dr. Hassan, I think she had a banner, and she... Um, so we are working together. If you just let Dr. Hassan know, and then if you are working here at the university, she will count it as a credit for you. If you come to me to one of the school, either uh, North Star or um, uh, Northeast, at the, um, mostly at the end of the school with the CLC program, after a school program, um, we will accept the volunteers to work with our students, specifically if you are a teacher or you would like to practice your language. We have always homework for those students. Uh, we have some students who is behind than others, so we can send those students student to after a school program. So this, I know this is available always. And just one more thing to mention to my brother there from Libya. Um, there is little different between Kate mentioned that it's heritage and word language. So we are starting with heritage, okay? Heritage, it's only the one who is speaking the language or their families speaking the language. And then we would like definitely to move uh, forward to a word language. Uh, I just want to thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, this is a really great opportunity. But I know you guys touched on um, introducing Arabi to other schools other than North Star and Northeast. I was kind of just wondering what are some steps that need to be taken or some actions that could lead to the Arabi language being taught in Southwest, Southeast, Lincoln High, the other high schools. I was just wondering about that. Teachers. We need the teachers. The... Um, desire to have it and definitely Lincoln High is there um, and then the next piece would be uh, like Mr. al -Najim had just said we would like to start offering out as a world language program understanding that there are differences between those two language pathways but we would like to offer it for students who lived here who um, who speak English exclusively at home or maybe some other languages to have that world pathway. So I know that there's interest among the other schools, the principals in the school. The next piece is we need the teachers. And I think I see you all here in the room today. So to that end, I would add that in my department, the Department of Teaching, Learning and Teacher Education and the College of Education and Human Sciences, we do our very best in, in collaboration with modern languages to offer um, a, the degree program, a bachelor's degree um, in secondary education um, that leads with us focus on world languages. And we have had students who have taught languages like Arabic um, and are interested in doing that or who want to be uh, teachers of Chinese. So we've, we've made that possible and I think it's important to um, know that we are currently educating uh, uh, college students from Iraq who are also becoming English language teachers, English language arts teachers. And so they're coming back to the public schools as English teachers, but they also have that resource of knowing Arabic. And so you can actually um, teach both um, eventually. And, and we have a math teacher currently in the public schools who can teach both Arabic and, um, and math, for example. So I think this is something, there's a teacher shortage, a very huge teacher shortage all over the United States, but especially in Nebraska. So there are jobs available for people that can do more than one thing in the public schools. They, you can be a world language teacher of Arabic or heritage teacher of Arabic, and you can do a, be a teacher of another subject. Um, I think there is need, too, in elementary schools of teachers who have bilingual endorsements. So you can be an elementary school teacher and also seek um, um, to have certification course classes endorsement related to another language like Arabic so that you can be a classroom teacher that can also talk to kids in Arabic and in English, which would be so powerful in this city. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone about this at any time. So um, if 
just ask Dr. Hassan for my contact information and I would be happy to connect people with, with the, the appropriate faculty on our campus so that um, you can move on with becoming a teacher. We have time. One more question. Hi, my name is Maryam Al Ajil. I'm a senior at Lincoln Southwest. And my main question I know you started talking about your main point right now is about heritage. Um, there is a lot of, um, I'm close with, because uh, I'm Iraqi, like I'm close with a lot of Iraqi Americans. And a lot of what I see is that they are almost de attached from like the heritage part of their community and they refuse to be a part of it because they want to assimilate to a certain like image. I go to Southwest, so it's mainly white. And so they want to be a part of that image. How, how would you recommend to, I want to say counter it, but like be more Arabic, I guess. I'm not sure. Like, yes. That's what Kate was, that's what you said. We are short of teachers. Otherwise, all of the six, it will be eight high schools in Lincoln. They will all have Arabic language. Today, tomorrow, one year, two years, three years, eventually we will have Arabic language there. But we are short of teachers. And one more, I think, just like they say, they say it. Even if you are a biology teacher, as long as you have a teaching certificate and you got it from there or your Arabic is so great, at this point is not necessarily to be majored in Arabic language. Myself, I majored in Arabic language, but it's not necessarily to have a major in Arabic language because we are teaching level one and level two for now. So even if you have any teaching certificate from any major, you are welcome to apply. And we are opening it soon, I think in April, right? All right, thank you to every single one of our panel speakers. Can we please give one last round of applause?